right, thank you very much. And now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our panelists. And before I do that, I would like to welcome and thank uh, 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 Professor Anand Raghunathan, uh, who is going to join us here on stage. He is uh, the organizer and moderator of the panel, uh, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. And Professor Agunathan is also the Associate Director of the, Bur of the Center for Brain in Spark Computing uh, here on our campus. So uh, our panelists, we have, of course, Professor Jim DiCarlo that you already heard from, uh, Professor of Neuroscience and the Head of the Department of uh, Brain and Cognitive Sciences. So thank you, Jim, again. Professor Jennifer Neville. There we go. Professor Neville is the Professor of Computer Science and Statistics here at Purdue. And the third panelist is uh, Professor Kosik Roy. Uh, professor Roy is a uh, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering um, and the Director of the Brain Inspired Computing at Purdue. So I would like all of us to give a warm welcome to our moderator and our panelists. Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to uh, uh, discuss this very exciting uh, topic with a set of very distinguished and, and really well-qualified panelists. So um, following up on Jim's talk, um, we thought we would uh, try to address this question in the panel. And I, I think it's an apt one because it did come up in the questions that the audience asked. Um, so. Um, the way we'll run this is like a typical panel. I'll give a very brief um, introduction, and the panelists will have an opportunity to make opening statements, but uh, the true key to success of any panel lies in the audience participation. So please jump in, ask, you know, don't shy away from asking questions that might be you know, tough or controversial. You know, we hope to get a lively discussion going. So thank you all for uh, staying back and participating as well. So. Um, uh, as um, uh, Dimitri said, we have uh, three, three panelists here. Uh, let me quickly try to um, give you a little bit of background to this question. Um, so as you all know, stepping a little bit broader away uh, from, new, from uh, AI and looking at computing at large, uh, human brains, biological brains, have been an enduring source of inspiration for computing throughout the history of computing. Right. Um, this is uh, George Boole and his uh, book uh, published in 1854 titled An Investigation of the Laws of Thought, which led to Boolean algebra, which, as we all know, is, is the foundation for modern digital computers. Um, moving forward by about a century, uh, this is von Neumann and his book on the computer and the brain, and you know, it's a very interesting read, available online as the previous book as well. Um, and uh, Alan Turing as well, right, with uh, his uh, uh, article titled Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Uh, and a rather funny quote associated with him, he's uh, supposed to have shouted this out loud in the cafeteria of Bell Labs. I'm not interested in developing a powerful brain. After, all I'm after is just a mediocre brain, something like the president of the American Telephone and Telegraph <laughs> Company. <laughs> and uh, fast forwarding to 2019, uh, the winners of the Turing Award, named after Alan Turing, this year uh, were Jan Lecon, Jeff Hinton, and, um, um, and Joshua Bengio. Uh, coincidentally, Jeff Hinton is a descendant of George Boole. Um, uh, their award was for conceptual and engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks, brain-inspired networks, a critical component of computing. So clearly, we've had a lot of inspiration from biology and computing from time to time. It's, uh, now, focusing specifically on AI and neuroscience, uh, and Jim referred to this virtuous cycle. So uh, we certainly hope that AI and, and neuroscience can form this virtual cycle where, on the one hand, neuroscience informs advances in AI. And, and uh, Jim uh, you know, addressed that very well in his talk. But I think a virtuous cycle needs you know, two links. You need to complete the loop, right? And so certainly advances in AI should help better understanding the brain. And the later part of Jim's talk addressed that as well. Uh, now, this is a broad topic, right? So while I'd welcome um, audience questions on, on any aspect of this, um, for the preset questions I have for the panelists, I focused on one of those links, which is you know, going from neuroscience to AI or neuroscience-inspired neuroscience AI. And this is a recent uh, series of articles in Nature titled the brain, a source of inspiration. And in particular, um, I, I, if you're interested, refer you to 
read the article from uh, Demis Hassabis of Google DeepMind and others. Um, and they list some key ideas from neuroscience that have inspired AI, starting with just the concept of artificial neurons or artificial neural networks in the first place, uh, moving on to deep neural networks where you have more than two layers, hidden layers, um, reward living uh, learning or reinforcement learning, uh, the notion of attention, paying attention to different parts of a visual scene, for example, the notion of episodic memory, uh, remembering and replaying um, things that you experience perhaps while you sleep, uh, the notion of a working memory, mm. continual learning, and so on and so forth. So these are some ideas, just to name a few, where if you uh, look at the papers being published, you will see references being made back to the literature in neuroscience. Okay? Uh, now, of course, this is not to say that these ideas could not be explained in other ways, you know, without referring to neuroscience, and, and hopefully that's something we'll talk about in the panel. Uh, but this is sort of the starting point, and so with that, I'd like to start the panel by laying out these questions to the panelists. Right? What are, looking back, the first que question looks back and, and the other three look forward, what are the major success stories of neuroscience having driven meaningful advances in AI? And, and maybe a subplot to that would be, you know, which of those, uh, you know, have perfectly good explanations uh, without a neuroscience basis? Um, what, the second question is, looking forward, what benefits can we expect from neuroscience-driven AI going forward? In some, some sense, um, Artificial intelligence is already superhuman in its capabilities, right? In, in, in a very narrow sense, for sure, at, at specific tasks. Uh, so can we really uh, still gain uh, by being neuroscience inspired? Um, the third question is, how do we take valuable lessons from the brain while avoiding blind biomimicry? Um, and uh, I think Jim used the phrase, uh, so I'll borrow it, feathered wings, building planes with feathered wings. We don't want to do that. Uh, but how do we strike that balance? Uh, and last but not the least, how do we reflect the differing substrates, right? So the brain is built on wetware, right? Biological cells and essentially a vat of chemicals. Uh, but we don't build our artificial intelligence systems on the same substrate, right? We, we have we use hardware or software uh, or hardware and software uh, on which artificial intelligence uh, is realized, right? So how, do, how does that affect the approach to um, borrowing ideas from neuroscience. So these are some of the questions, but I hope they're not all of the questions. I, I really hope that we'll have uh, more interesting questions coming from you, the audience. So with that, um, I will give Jim a break because he's been speaking for 45 minutes. So I thought I'd start the proceedings with, with Jennifer. Um, so she'll, she'll go first and, and then Jim uh, and then Kaushik. Okay, so I'm gonna stand over here. Uh, Could we switch to Jennifer's presentation? Oh, is it on a different slide? Okay, great. So I'm gonna stand over here because I haven't presented these slides before, so I need to be able to look at them to tell you um, what I'm gonna say. So I am not a neuroscience researcher. I am an AI and machine learning researcher from the computer science department. So I will give you my view of what's going on in the AI space and how that connects to neuroscience in a limited way. Um, oh, let me go back. So let me start with um, just framing the question that we have focused on in the area of AI is really how to represent knowledge and reason with it inside an algorithm. And we have taken a lot of insights from how we do this in our brain. Um, and there is a nice uh, feedback loop back and forth between the computational algorithm people and the um, neuroscientists or psychologists who are studying it in the brain. But from a history of AI um, perspective, there's two main camps of AI, and the first main camp is called symbolic AI. And you can see this, I can't even see the quote at the bottom here, from Newell and Simon in 1976. It, they uh, claim that a physical symbol system has the necessary and sufficient means for general intelligent action. And so when um, Newell and Simon were really two of the fathers of the field of AI, and they thought that the way that we reasoned and decided how to act in the world was to have symbols that we thought about. So here it's showing you their symbols related to people and objects in the world and the relationship between them, and that is how we decide how to plan and act and behave in the world. Um, and a, another thread of AI, you could call connectionist AI, which is really the set, the areas of AI that have focused on 
representing information in these neural networks in the brain. And in this sense, what they thought that information was represented in the weights inside these neural networks and how the units connected to each other and act how they were activated and the memory that was used in those um, neural network structures in the brain. And so for a long time in the field of AI, these were very two separate threads. And um, I'm glad that uh, Anand put up the Turing Award winners because I tried to find a quote with respect to connectionist AI, but I think this is actually the best quote here from Jeff Hinton where he said, now that uh, they've gotten the Turing Award, he guesses that neural networks are now respectable computer science because for a long time, um, it was sort of looked down on um, and most of the field of AI thought that symbolic methods were really the way to go. And um, even though there are these two threads of research, they were really being pursued um, jointly in parallel over the course of, this is one of my slides that shows the history of machine learning, where, uh, oh, it didn't transfer very well to um, a Windows machine, but this shows you that at the top in machine learning, we had a bunch of uh, symbolic methods that included rules and decision trees and graphical models. And then on the bottom, we had more continuous methods that started with linear models. And I guess I didn't put artificial neural networks here, but I should have put the word artificial and kernel methods and finally deep learning. And along the way, what we were learning with respect to both of these models was how to put information into the algorithms or the representations in order to learn better, um, more accurate models in the end. And what I want to point to here is this focus on inductive bias in the 1970s, uh, in early 80s, because that's what I'm going to come back to when I talk about the relationship with neuroscience. So just to give you a quick, um, uh, I had sort of one idea to talk about the connection between neuroscience and machine learning, and that is in the area of reinforcement learning, which is a subfield of machine learning that focuses on how to learn in cases where you get delayed rewards. So for example, when you're playing a game, you don't get immediate feedback after you make a move of whether that was the right move or not. Eventually, you just win or lose the game. And you have to figure out, based on that delayed reward, how to back up um, uh, value of each of the moves you made along the way to learn to figure out how to decide what's a good um, strategies over time. And so there have been people studying this kind of process both in biological systems as well as in computational algorithmic procedures in the area of machine learning. And really there's been a nice correspondence here between what the theoretical algorithms did in machine learning and what's been found in neuroscience about how this works in the brain. And in particular, they found that the, if they t look at the signals of the dopamine neurons in the brain, that those really encode what we call reward prediction errors, which is what we need in the algorithms that d specify the difference between the expected reward that you think you're going to get. For example, you expect to win the game if you make a certain move, and what actually happens. And so then you learn from that over time that what you expected to happen either did happen happen or didn't happen and adjust your strategy over time. And that really shows a physical manifestation of the exact mathematical procedures that are encoded in temporal difference learning and reinforcement learning, an algorithm that was invented um, by Rich Sutton in 1988. And so this really shows you the connections back and forth between things that we ex um, explore in the machine learning uh, world algorithmically just to see if we can get these algorithms to mimic the behavior that we want to see for example, that they can learn how to win the game, like AlphaGo or playing Atari games, which is being worked on right now, and what is actually happening in the substrates in our, in our physical brains, and whether we can show that the same kind of processes are happening. So in terms of moving forward, what I just wanted to point to is that as we try to merge these two fields together, it really is going to help us do what I think is the next thing that we need to do in machine learning, which is to merge or unify together these symbolic and connectionist views. So um, that is really what a lot of the current work in machine learning on is, is working on right now, is how to take these more complicated abstractions that we reason with in symbolic systems and push them down into a neural network formulation 
um, by reasoning over more complex sets, for example, graphs or sequences with special kinds of invariances in them. And we're learning how to do that mathematically, algorithmically right now. But what we would hope to find is that we can see the same sort of signals in a neuroscience investigations that can help drive forward that um, synergy. And I think in particular, the area of social neuroscience right now is looking at very interesting questions about how you process information when you're in social situations and have to interact with people. And for example, I think maybe I've picked the wrong figure here, but for example, some of the recent work by Emily Falk um, from the University of Pennsylvania and her colleagues have looked at whether you, how you are positioned in your social network actually affects how the neurons activate in the brain when you're processing certain information. So that you actually, they've shown that you actually have different firing patterns when you see someone based on on their positional um, uh, set, setting in your neural and your social network structure. There's way too many network <laughs> words that we're trying to use here. So for example, if you're close to them, tied to them very um, tightly in a social network, it'll fire in a different way than when you see somebody that you're more lo loosely connected to in your social network, which is exactly the type of things that our machine learning algorithms are trying to use to make more accurate predictions about people and their behaviors in social networks. Okay, so that's it. That's all I had to Thank, thank you, uh, Jen, and uh, I guess next, Jim. Uh, you already showed a bunch yeah. of slides, so. Yeah, I don't, I'd, I'd rather get to move to the discussion, so I sort of gave you my opening views on things in my talk, so let's, in the interest of time, maybe let Kashi, is that okay? Thanks, thanks, Jim. Uh -huh. Oh, I, I got one. Oh. And that's yours, <laughs> you can ask questions. Oh, okay. Um, I was seeing, okay. Yeah. All right, uh, so uh, I'm going to get closer to you guys so that I can see better. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, certainly deep learning has made a huge amount of progress, and we know that, right? Uh, but uh, let's look at where we are today uh, in terms of uh, energy consumption. You know, I'm going to take the engineering point of view and try to look at the energy consumption. And this is actually a plot of uh, the chart shows uh, the AI compute demand, especially for training. Uh, the y-axis basically shows the number of operations required uh, to train for, let's say, image classification, language processing, or optimization approaches. And um, uh, as an example, if you take uh, one of those uh, networks uh, implementing, let's say, one of the optimization problems like uh, network architecture synthesis, uh, the results are actually quite uh, amazing. I mean, the number of operations required are, uh, you know, zeta operations for training, which is uh, of the order of about 10 to the 21 or so. Uh, but if I were to really look at the carbon footprint uh, for training uh, that particular network, this is actually quite amazing. Uh, the estimated carbon emission for the NAS, which is the network architecture synthesis on the transformer, which is a network, is about 315x higher than air travel from New York to San Francisco per passenger, 17x um, uh, higher than the average American one year, and about 5x higher than a car lifetime. So that those are really amazing numbers, huh? huge amount of uh, energy consumption. And that's for training. Now on the other side of it, if I were to really look at uh, um, uh, uh, inference, and this is something that we're all familiar with, uh, in the, you know, um, uh, the Google AlphaGo beating Lee Sedol back in uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, but the question of course is at what cost? You know, what's the amount of uh, power consumption mm -hmm. or energy, uh, the power consumption and energy required? It turns out back in 1997, the IBM Deep Blue beating Kasparov, that was about, uh, you know, 15,000 watts. Um, you know, at that time, Kasparov was very, very upset about it. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, more recently, 2016, uh, Google AlphaGo, about 300,000 watts. Uh, how efficient is a brain? The number might not be exact, but uh, probably of the order of about uh, you know, 20 watts, which is uh, about 10 to the 4, um, uh, you know, uh, mag uh, 10 orders of, uh, uh, 4 orders of magnitude higher uh, than uh, what the brain does. Hmm? Now, um, and that's a high performance scenario. Now, if I were to really look at uh, uh, the efficiency gap in a, if you are to try to implement, for example, some of these AI algorithms, uh, into your, uh, let's say you have a smart glass, and if you try to implement that, and as an example, if I were to take a, a smart glass like this, implement uh, 
a Google Edge TP on it uh, for inference. And if I were to try to analyze it, uh, we'll find out that the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the battery lifetime is going to be of the order of about an hour or so. So if you would like to have, uh, you know, battery life about, uh, you know, uh, eight to ten hours, uh, turns out you really have to do something different. Uh, so where do these inefficiencies come from? You know, partly we don't know how the brain does it, but the inefficiencies really come from the fact that, hey, uh, we don't know the good algorithms, we don't have the right kind of hardware architecture, and we certainly don't have the right kind of neural circuits and devices. So with that in mind, the question, of course, is, you know, can we do better? Can we really come up with uh, a system, uh, the next generation of AI systems, uh, looking at the right kind of algorithms, right kind of architecture and circuits? And in order to do that, I believe that we can take some cues from the brain. Uh, because we have an existential proof that the brain does good. Uh, whether it does the best or not, I don't know, but it certainly does well. Uh, to that effect, can we really look at neuroscience and uh, really try to find out the kind of network topologies uh, which are used in the brain. Huh? And to that effect, uh, you know, uh, Jim talked about uh, the Cornet kind of architecture, which is a brain-like, you know, ar architecture, and it is a good brain score. Uh, would, that would that architecture be suitable? Would that architecture give me the kind of energy improvement that I would like to have? Uh, how about the information, uh, you know, representation in the brain? Uh, they are usually in terms of spikes. Uh, it turns out, you know, if I'm, uh, you know, if I'm a circuit designer, the spikes are good. Why are spikes good? Because it can let me do even-driven computation. So if I can learn with spikes, and if I can do even-driven computation, one can potentially get a large amount of improvement in energy consumption. Can we do better learning? Uh, you know, we have to see that. Uh, again, we can also uh, kind of look at different kinds of learning models. But uh, whatever we design today, uh, these kind of networks, they're still black boxes. You know, we don't really know why they work, and a lot of times we don't know why they don't work. Uh, to that effect, there's a need for understanding these networks. There's a theoretical uh, understanding required. And again, we can actually go to you know, communication theory, uh, computer science theory, and you know, go into more of the mathematical foundations to find out, can we come up with better theory of learning? Uh, can we have better network optimizations? And at the end of it, that might lead to better safety and robustness of these systems. Today, these systems may not be as robust as we want them to be. And finally, at the end of it, what happens is that we end up implementing everything with our CMOS circuits. So what are these CMOS circuits? They are basically you know, good on-off switches. Mm -hmm. And are good on-off switches good for neurons and synapses? Probably not. So the question then is that, is it possible that I really think of devices that can in some ways mimic the neuron and the synaptic functionalities of different biofidelity, and that might lead to uh, better neuromimetic devices and uh, better neural computing fabrics. So those are the kind of things that one can potentially look at. By the way, these are some of the things that, as a part of our Center, Center for Brain Inspired Computing that we're looking at, and hopefully uh, we're all working together as a part of that center, uh, and hopefully we can potentially get uh, uh, you know, quantum improvement uh, in the near future. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Kaushik. Um, so maybe uh, what we could do is if you could go back to my presentation and put up the questions on the screen that we had. Uh, I'll get it started with the first question. Looking back, um, among many of these advances that you know, undoubtedly were inspired by neuroscience, right? You know, uh, the pioneers you know, refer to um, inspirations from the brain. Um, how many of them, which of them do you think, where do you think that inspiration was crucial, right? Um, and uh, to give you some examples, right, maybe um, uh, if, if you think of uh, the notion of deep neural networks or having many layers, that could also, for instance, be justified, you know, perfectly well by looking at, you know, when hardware, when we design logic circuits, we, we all know that designing circuits with two levels of logic is not scalable when the circuit, when the function gets more complex. You need a multi-level circuit, and, and this is also, you know, uh, forms the basis of, uh, you know, the circuit complexity-based analysis in computer science theory, for example, right? So that's an alternative way of looking at the rationale for deep or multi-layer networks, right? Um, convolution, uh, you know, we have Professor Riebman sitting in here uh, who's uh, sort of signal and image processing. I think the notion of convolution, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, far predates... <laughs> Uh, you know, in, in, in just in electrical engineering, uh, when it was sort of actually discovered, the brain has these visual fields that show uh, spatial invariance. So 
there are alternative explanations for some of these phenomena, uh, but at the same time, it is clear that you know, uh, uh, neuroscience has been a source of inspiration. So maybe the first set of first question I might um, set forth to the panelists is to you know, from your perspectives, which of these are you do you think are the crucial um, uh, inspirations that that AI has been benefited from you know, coming from neuroscience? Start with Jim. Well, I, just briefly, because I think I think in the interest of, I mean, I, I think it's very hard to sort of say where, what came from what in fields, and I think the fact that that's hard to say, I mean, that's exactly where we want to be in that, going forward, because you know, we all of these things, you know, there's sort of, you know, a lot of the original backprop stuff was published in cognitive science journals. Does that mean it came from cognitive scientists or engineers, right? So. So the folks that were working in these intersections, Jeff, you mentioned some of the Turing Award winners, or Jeff among them, that they. they they were, you know, inspired by the brain and working in these spaces of ideas. And are they, you know, am I an engineer or a scientist? I'm not actually sure. But sort of in my lab, I try to put these people together. And it's sort of rather than debate which came from one field or another, I think the notion that you put people together and say, There's a, this is at least an instance proof, so let's try to monitor it. But it's, it's a question of resource allocation. You know, I don't, think, I don't think if you want to do AI, you should invest all your money and figure out how the brain works and then do AI. I also don't think you should spend everything on you know, just straight up engineering, forward engineering, hope that it will be like the brain, some balance between those two. And I think that is sort of the spirit of what, what's going on. But assigning these crucial ideas, I think that's a little bit of a, you're just asking speculation, it'd be hard to trace back. So anything I'd say, you'd say somebody else had, could have thought of it a different way, right? So I, I don't think it's a, it's a fair, fair question. Sorry not to give you a hard time, but that's. You know. So you're questioning the question, in other words. In, in effect, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. Any thoughts, uh, Jen or Kaushik? Uh, I, I kind of agree with um, uh, you know, Jim. Um, but if you were to really think about inspiration, certainly, or uh, some sort of uh, you know, brain-guided approach, the very fact that we're using some sort of a neural network uh, possibly came from you know, the brain possibly has neuron synapses connected with some interesting ways. Can it, can it do some interesting functionality? So uh, is that from neuroscience? Possibly. Uh, at one time, yeah. Um, but at the end of it, when it comes to engineering, we certainly have to implement uh, those in, uh, in an effective, interesting ways. Uh, I, we certainly don't have the biological neurons to play with, or at least for my circuits. Um, I still have to use uh, an artificial um, a neuron, which is going to be consisting mostly of transistors and connected in some interesting ways. Um, uh, so uh, again, that's where the engineering comes into play. Uh, do I have the synapses? Uh, uh, probably not. Uh, we have to come up with uh, you know, uh, a solution to these, some of these synapses using, again, the CMOS transistors in some ways. Um, that's certainly engineering. That's certainly devices. That's certainly circuits. Yeah, I guess I would say that um, the field of AI has uh, often tried to mimic human behavior, which would be trying to see what's going on in the brain and actually do the same thing. But also a second thrust would be to just have algorithms that are going to behave rationally. And one thing we could discuss is whether we want our algorithms to behave like humans who are often irrational in their decisions or what information they pay attention to or what strategies they take or whether we want them to be more predictable and deterministic um, in terms of moving forward. So that's one thing to think about. Um, I guess I would also point out, I brought this up at lunch, that um, the recent advances in machine learning, while you might think that they're all from deep learning, given the current hype in the news, actually a lot of progress had been made on models that came from machine learning that were not neural network based. And really, they have proven to be able to be scale to very large environments and be very accurate and very predictive. Of course, neural networks are helping us push the boundaries even further, but I would say that we have made some progress in just being sort of engineers and trying to get the thing that is going to be the most predictive, and then later on we go back and think about how do we understand what's going on in that algorithm, either from a mathematical perspective or from connecting it to um, neuroscience. So I think it's also impossible to tease them apart, but there is this nice back and forth between the two. Great. Um, so I think we have a question from the audience. So in the interest of uh, making sure we, you know, the audience gets priority, let's go ahead. 
awesome site. Sorry, I have to leave in about 10 minutes, so I want to ask it now. Um, it seems very much through this whole talk that we are talking a lot about neuroscience connection with AI, but in a sense, we're not making so much a human as we're making the perfect engineering student. You know, we have this problem, we have to solve it. You know, um, whether it's in computer science, neuroscience, uh, engineering, but there's a whole side of the brain that hundreds of people have, which I would kind of describe as the liberal arts student, you know, where that goal is not so well defined, where you have to really, um, you don't necessarily have this end goal. You're not necessarily doing something for a purpose. So are there any research, is there any research currently into, you know, that side of the brain and if that side can help strengthen um, this almost engineering side? Because some of the great minds of all time, you know, for say, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, he was an excellent engineer, but he also was an excellent um, liberal arts student. So I guess, is there anything currently involved where are they all kind of focusing on this more um, engineering side of the mind? Sounds like a question for Jim. Well, there's, th there's different levels to try to take your question. I was trying to, you know, there's a version of just, you know, what we all do. Many of us are goal-driven. You know, I presented, you know, our stuff is very goal-driven. Let's build a simulated copy of the system, and that's our goal. And you might say, well, that's the wrong goal. You should have a different goal. I mean, there's versions like that. There's one, that, that is the engineering side of me. But I think you're asking something more meta about where do, let's say even where do new ideas come from, right? Like, rather, there's a sort of hypothesis generation phase followed by, or once you have a space of hypothesis, like even the families of deep neural network models, then you can say, okay, now we can engineer and optimize against it, and, like, and then ML effectively takes over. But I think you're asking more deeply, where do hypotheses come from? I mean, I can tell you some neuroscience work about like elements of that, but that's more on like small species, like how do birds learn to sing? One of my colleagues, Michael Fee at MIT, works on that. The bird has to generate variability in the song to then shape that. So you could call that variability generation as hypothesis generation, but there's sort of much more cognitive level versions of the same kind of question. Where do new ideas even come from? And I think that's the spirit of what you're after. I don't yet know the answers to that. Again, there's a hint of neuroscience there, but um, that is, those are really hard intelligence questions. I'm sure Jen or would have more to say about this than I would from the neuroscience side, other than that's not a question our, our lab with vision is working on. We're more, much more goal-directed. Yeah, I would say from the AI perspective, I don't know if this exactly answers your question, but there are people working on creativity in art and dance and music and humor and those are some of the much harder questions in order to get an algorithm that can generate things that are sort of objectively beautiful to people or new and interesting and um, certainly there's a lot of work on neural networks producing you know, new art that looks exactly like it was generated by Van Gogh but is not exactly you know, a Van Gogh that was painted, whether or not that's actually truly creative or that's just another objective function that the, the model is applying, I think is an open question. So mm -hmm. um, I think uh, one interesting uh, tidbit is that um, in these chatbot systems that are trying to talk and interact with people, they've found that um, some people just want to keep the conversation going and they don't have a goal of I need to book a flight or I need to add this meeting to my schedule. And so they, some of the researchers have been working with improv actors to actually try to get data about how are, how are you creative and how do you improvise. And eventually if we get enough data from that, there's an expectation that we're gonna be able to learn how to do that from a model <laughs> as an optimization <laughs> procedure. But maybe that's a very engineering way to think about it. So it's still an open question whether we'll be successful or not. Thank you. There was one more question up here. Hi. Um, uh, my question is for anyone. So we have some algorithms that are able to perform very well at um, very specific tasks like chess and Go and AlphaGo. But uh, those algorithms are um, very geared towards performing those tasks only and don't really generalize well to a human brain as, as in terms of telling us like what a game is or um, doing any of the things that a normal adult or even a child can do. So I guess my question is how, um, how long do you imagine it will take, I guess, to uh, achieve the goal of reverse engineering the brain or um, any brain, like a human brain, a child brain, um, in terms of years or like do you think this can even be something that can be reasonably achieved 
in our lifetime or in a span of uh, many years? What do, what do you think about that? How do you envision that taking place? Well, we, as the scientists are always supposed to say it's 10 years out, right? So, I mean, <laughs> but it's always 10 years out. But no, it's going to be at least 10 years out. But you're right that the current things are narrow, but they're certainly way broader than they were 10 years ago, right? So I think maybe we should make some plot of the progression of narrowness. It's even hard to define the space of problems. I like to step back and go, if you, were, if you came down from another planet and said, look at these organisms here, all of us, we're narrow too with respect to some framing, right? And I think that's sort of a lost thing. We think we're like some generalists to do everything. Like I could show you white noise patterns and like say, can you separate this from that? You're like, I don't know what those are, right? There's a, you're really optimized in some narrow space that evolution has sort of built. This is again speaking from the vision side, but also, you know, even your motor mechanics, everything you do, your ways of thinking, how you use language, these are structures that are, we are narrow in a very, if you sort of step back and say, imagine you go to another planet, right? Or maybe there's even new physics, right? There's a, there's a narrowness still. It's just a question of scale. But you're right, these systems are narrow, but they're getting wider. And you're asking, when does the width essentially capture ours? And I, I get, if we could try to make, you know, the engineer would say, well, let's make some plots of width and like operationalize it. And then maybe we'd make an extrapolation. And I, I, I've never done that. Maybe you guys have thought about that. But it's, I certainly think we're going to need a lot of advances on the hardware side, even the bio embodied system side. If you really think about agents in the world, this is much more than, it's much more than just say sensor processing, which is what we work on. And that, that feels like there's a whole slew of engineering beyond just kind of um, information processing that, that's going to be needed to even imagine such a world, right? That, 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 and that's more to things that Kaushik and, and Anand think about. But again, that's my perspective. No, I agree. I mean, uh, you know, it depends on how you define the brain to be. Is it a human brain or is it uh, another artificial brain that we are actually building? I mean, today we can do a whole lot of things, right? I mean, but, uh, and I mean, again, going back to what is narrow, what is broad, uh, uh, it, it keeps changing, and we keep doing new things. Um, there are advancements in, uh, you know, algorithms. There are advancements in uh, uh, circuits and architecture. In fact, even devices today, uh, which are helping in developing broader, uh, you know, better, broader systems. Yeah. I don't know. I can't predict. Um, I think one, uh, you know, other, uh, I guess, uh, relevant uh, thought here is that. You don't need to fully understand the brain um, in order to, you know, have some practical utility in any of those application areas Jim talked about, right? You know, as we find more and more, there are there's sort of there's an incremental path forward. We can already see uh, utility from that, whether it be to you know health and medicine or you know brain machine interfaces or to AI. So uh, there's a question, right? Uh, actually, there mic there's a mic back there, and then we'll take one more. After all these uh, nice large scale questions, here's a smaller scale one. Uh, so when you're talking about the models, uh, either neural or computational, uh, we're mostly talking about cell body firing. What would be the model or circuit equivalent of dendritic computations? Well, so, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, so some people would like to think of a whole neuron with all its dendrites as it being, maybe those are multiple nodes with separate compute compartments. This is, these, this is there's certain people who think that's how it, it might be. I mean, this is, this is really, um, I think I would say that's not um, yet clear. Um, and and uh, again, I'm, I can, I'm not maybe going to speculate a bit more on that, but I mean, it's one of those many things that the, the neurons, I mean, I had a slide I pulled out, which is, what needs to change in our current neural network model? Should we start building fancier dendrites was sort of one of the points on that slide. So there's, there's many things that differ architecturally between the current models. And, and it's really like educated guesses. This is sort of like, are those more the feathers and those more the, but then it kind of depends on your objective function a bit. Like, is that gonna be an energy savings goal or is that gonna be something that's gonna make it perform better or be more robust? And we don't really know the answers to those, so we're gonna take incremental guesses and try to implement versions, that's at least our approach, and then see where they show improvements. Um, but other, I'm just, people still speculate about that. I mean, of course, there's measurements of individual cells and what they do, but how that translates from the cell all the way up to like a full network performance is completely unclear, and I don't know how to do that without you know, actually trying it, but maybe someone more theoretically savvy than me will figure that out. But my version would be build it and see if it works better. Um, but that's tough to do at scale. So I don't think that's an answer, but at least that's, I'm just giving you where, where we are on this. Yes. 
So the question is, we know that the brain has different structure, different architecture in different <laughs> regions, and even the neurons have several types. Um, why don't we use that information in building the models? Why do, why do we try to build a very simplistic model where the units are actually homogeneous, where as we know, it's definitely not that in the brain. So for example, uh, you were trying to emulate area V4, but we know that up to area V4, there are different types of neurons, there are different types of structure, but we are using just homogeneous layers. Do you think there is some area of improvement that can be used, uh, more information and maybe a different approach to just fitting a simple model? Right, so that's a great question. If I handed you a tissue slide of V4 in IT, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So you would say, look, there's neuro the, the connectivity circuits actually look very similar at the anatomical level. This is, the, this is long known that cortical structures, there are some exceptions, but they're very similar anatomically. But your point about even within V4 or within IT, there's many cell types and most of these models, and this is related to the dendrite question, many of these models are just assuming one cell, which is just an integrate and fire kind of thing. And of course, wait, what about the inhibitory neurons and these particular cell types? There's a whole parts list there that isn't put in. And again, one, this is back to the feathers. Would, should we just implement that all and put it together and hope it works, which is sort of like the dendrite version, or that's the, that's the blue brain pod project in Europe, in effect, was put that all in. That is very hard to do at scale. So you know, where we're really at is taking kind of guesses as to, well, maybe we should try this slight move in that direction. Like for us, it's like local recurrence was a slight move in that direction. Um, because the, part, the parts list of, of neuroscience is huge, and you just can't imagine implementing that all right now and, you know, and then getting all the parameters right to make it sort of just stand up and walk out of the room. It's sort of too, too big of a leap. So you have to kind of take these, we have some traction now with these sort of networks, and you know, if you add up, you know, just increment off of that is how I think of it. Like, as you said, like, there's, there are other things, and, and we, we can add some of them, but we need to sort of be smart in how we add them and then what improvements they give, right? That rather than just trying to throw it all in at once, because that feels impossible to me. But it's a good mo inspiration that you're pointing out. But from the circuits and architecture point of view, it does make sense in some cases to actually use different kinds of neurons. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, people have uh, looked at some of those. Uh, the problem certainly comes in different ways. I mean, can you effectively train some of those uh, large-scale networks in some interesting ways? Uh, you know, I mean, we can certainly distribute different kinds of neurons, but training becomes an issue. Uh, and then, then, of course, you have to really think about uh, inference. But uh, just to give you an idea that people have looked at uh, combinations of uh, at least, uh, you know, if, if you want to call ReLU to be a you know, good neuron, uh, along with some radial neurons and all, to actually look at uh, different kinds of, you know, robustness issues. Can I get a better robust circuit uh, for those? Uh, people have looked at some of those, yeah. Uh, but not really from the uh, no, uh, neuroscience perspective, I would say. It's just a, uh, more from the mathematical side of things. Great. I, I know that there's a couple of uh, other questions, and I hate to break this up, but I've been given a hard stop uh, because our, our friends who are helping uh, cast this event are actually have other duties. Uh, there's other events uh, taking place, but I will, if the panelists don't mind, uh, volunteer that they could stay back for a little longer to help uh, you know, answer some of your questions. So feel free to chat, to, uh, chat with us after this is over. Maybe I'll invite each of you to make a very brief closing, like you know, a short uh, closing statement on um, uh, you know, any, any aspect of this uh, field or where you see it headed. Maybe a closing statement from each of you, and then we can wrap up. I'll just reiterate what I try to say in my talk. The intersection between neural network engineering and wanting to understand the brain is very exciting right now, and that flow is gonna I think that's gonna be a big booming area, certainly for neuroscience. It will be a bet whether those payoffs occur on the AI side, but it's gonna be required for us to actually say we understand ourselves, how to better educate our kids, how to do fixed brain disorders. The engineering applied to neuroscience is gonna, is gonna just get bigger and bigger with regard to understanding the brain. And there may be payoffs on AI that we're gonna be looking forward to. So I think if you're, and if you like both those questions, it's an exciting time to be working at that intersection. Thank you. So I think I forgot to say this in my opening remarks that um, 
I think what we can take from neuroscience is the inductive bias that we need to put into our models to help specialize them in ways that are going to allow them to grow to larger, more complex environments. And I think what Jim said earlier was a great example that we are actually specialized <laughs> narrow systems in some way. And if we can learn from what we see in the brain, either from different types of neurons or different ensembles, I don't know what dendrites are, but I'll look it up, <laughs> <laughs> that if we can then learn to incorporate that as a specialization into our models, that might be the thing that pushes us to that much more um, complex models that have more flexibility to reason about more complex environments. So I think that's really the exciting thing to, to look at the connection between the two. Well, uh, I certainly think it's a very, very exciting area of research, uh, especially looking at uh, neuroscience and engineering together. The way you know we are looking at things is uh, across the stack. I mean, I'm talking from the ing electrical engineering point of view, uh, going from algorithms. We don't know the right, right algorithms, coming up with the right learning and inference techniques, going further down into an architecture or a you know, proper kind of uh, you know implementation a hardware architecture suitable for that. And at the end of it, you're really thinking about, you know, should I really look at the devices, you know, moving away from the standard way of looking at, uh, you know, transistors only into a domain where you can really think of actually building directly neur neurons and synapses of different biofidelity, which can potentially lead to, uh, you know, very exciting results. So, um, you know, for the students here, I think it's a very, very exciting area, uh, exciting time and uh, ex exciting area of research. Great. Uh, so uh, I just want to conclude by saying that, you know, my takeaway from listening to all, all the three panelists is, you know, I think one common factor was their excitement for this area. So, so I hope that that, you know, at least those of you the students uh, who are looking for problems or areas to work on uh, will take that message uh, that this interface between neuroscience and engineering at large or more narrowly neuroscience and computing or even more narrowly neuroscience and AI is an exciting one. Uh, and, and hopefully some of you will be the next generation of leaders driving the advances to come. So with that, let's thank all the panelists once more and thank you all for your participation. Thank you.